All right, let's talk about our next section, which is race in America. And I wanna talk about the way black and brown Americans experience race in this country. Part of that experience is something called the talk. It happens regardless of class and income. Parents who feel they have no choice but to prepare their children for the chance that they could be targeted, including by the police, for no reason other than the color of their skin. Mr. Vice President, in the next two minutes, I want you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? I do. I'm gonna go first because I came up with an idea for an online education, for an online education course that's mandatory for um, probably middle school kids that teaches them how to interact with the police, but it also teaches them basic street law. So it teaches them their rights because what's the point in having rights if you don't know what your rights are? And I think one of the big problems with the minority communities is that they don't understand their rights. I keep seeing these videos of a guy who's like, I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not gonna give you, show you my driver's license because even though you pulled me over for speeding, he's like, I, why, are you, why do you need to see my driver's license? And he thinks that's his right. He doesn't have a right to not give his driver's license um, to, to a police officer if he's driving um, and, and he gets pulled over. That's just how it works. Because in the United States, um, the right to drive isn't a right. It's not in the Constitution. So if you get pulled over while driving, you are doing something that is a privilege and therefore you have to show your um, driver's license. And if you're walking down the street, you don't have to show your driver's license. And that's the difference. And I want to explain that to kids. And I think one of the biggest problems we have is that kids don't understand the law. That's what I'm for. Um, and, and so I think all, all parents should have the talk with their kids, which is you have the right to remain silent, wait to um, have a lawyer present when you talk to them. Um, you don't have to answer the door. They don't have the right to come into your house unless you actually open the door. Um, like, because they can, they can say they have probable cause. If, they, if, they, if you don't open the door, they don't have probable cause. That's the sort of thing I actually want to teach kids because I think the law should be on normal people's side. I don't think the law should be on the police's side. Um, I'm an online education guy, so that's why I wanted to do it that way. I do. You know, my daughter is a social worker, and... Uh... Before he actually explains whatever about his daughter, um, I do agree that black people are targeted more than white people, and I do think that black people are treated worse than white people because white people are kind of feared because there's nothing like a white lawyer that will sue you. And so police departments fear being sued. And so um, black people don't in, instill the same amount of fear in the police. Um, and that's why I am for police reform. Um, I'm, for, I'm also for uh, giving the police less reasons to harass people. And I think that's one of the biggest problems we have is the police have too many reasons to harass people and we're acting like nothing needs to change in the law. But if we change the law, the police won't have a reason to mess with people so much because the police should be there to protect people when they're in danger. The police should be there when you get robbed. The police shouldn't be there when you're just minding your own business. She's all, she's written a lot about this. She has a graduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania in social work. And you know, uh, one of the reasons why I ended up working on the east side of Wilmington, Delaware, which is 90% African American, was to learn more about what was going on. What I didn't, I never had to tell my daughter if she's pulled over, make sure she puts for a traffic stop, put both hands on top of the wheel and don't reach for the glove box because someone may shoot you. But a black parent, no matter how wealthy or how poor they are, has to teach their child when you're walking down the street, don't have a hoodie on when you go across the street, making sure that you, in fact, if you get pulled over, yes, yes, sir, no, sir, hands on top of the wheel, because you are, in fact, the victim, whether you're a person making 300,000, child of a $300,000 a year person, or someone who's on, on, on food stamps. The fact of the matter is, there is institutional racism in America. And we have always said, we've never lived up to it, that we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal, but guess what? We have never ever lived up to it, but we've always constantly been moving the needle further and further to inclusion, not exclusion. This is the first president to come along and says that's the end of that. 
We're not going to do that anymore. We have to provide for economic opportunity, better education, better health care, better access to schooling, better access to opportunity to borrow money to start businesses. All the things we can do, and I've laid out a clear plan as to how to do those things just to give people a shot. It's about accumulating the ability to have wealth as well as it is to be free from violence. President Trump. I wanted to comment on that real quick. I'm all about minority-owned businesses. I love black-owned businesses. I'm for small businesses. I think that small businesses are better at employing people than large corporations because um, Google can't, the, the, their ceiling for how much money they can make can get pretty high, but um, how many people they really need to work for them starts to get questionable at some point um, because they only have so many things that people can do. Even when they're doing all sorts of research projects, they, ha they have to find new things for people to do. Um, and, and then that hurts their ability to make profit and that hurts their ability to get people to put money into their stock, which um, you need people to want to buy your stock. Um, so... Uh, I'm all, I just wanted to say that uh, I am very for minority-owned businesses. Same question to you, and let me remind you of the question. I would like you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? Yes, I do. And again, he's been in government 47 years. He never did a thing, except in 1994, when he did such harm to the black community. And they were called, and he called them, super predators. And he said that. He said it, super predators. And they kept never lived that down. 1994, your crime bill, the super predators. Nobody has done more for the black community than Donald Trump. And if you look, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln, possible exception, but the exception of Abraham Lincoln, nobody has done what I've done. Criminal justice reform, Obama, what Donald Trump has done is created greater division between the races than we have ever had. I mean, like, like Joe just said, we were moving towards inclusion. It was, we were moving towards a society where uh, we stopped caring about race. And now we care about race so freaking much that it's turned people that weren't racist into racist people. I'm seeing people on the internet that I, I, they're married to minorities. And they sure are starting to seem a little racist. And it's like, your husband's Mexican. And it's like, you have Mexican children. Like, you're, you're, you're seeming racist here. But that's because this guy over here, Donald Trump, wants to make people that don't normally vote, he wants to make all these super hateful rednecks come out of the woodworks to vote for him. And he wants people to be passionate about him. And he thinks the best way to make people passionate about him is to make them racist. And I don't think that's the way we should move our society forward because I know the history of racism in the United States. I know the history of identity Christians like Timothy McVeigh who blew up um, a federal building in Oklahoma City with a fertilizer bomb and killed a lot of people. And um, like, like I mentioned in the last debate, Bill Clinton dealt with this um, militia group who was planning on poisoning a water supply. Um, that was when he was governor of Arkansas. And he, I mean, these people were very militarized. I mean, there are groups in the United States that are ve very militarized, and they want to fight for something because they believe that war is beautiful, and they love war, and they fantasize war, and they watch TV, or they fantasize about war, and they watch TV shows about war and they watch movies about war and they think that war is beautiful but really war is fear and i'm just saying like at some point i'm going to be grateful that there are a lot of people that fantasize about war because i'm trying to go to war because i think we need to deal with this russian spy problem i think we need to deal with the problem that our government is infiltrated that much that we don't know who we're for and that's why the way i'm doing this war i don't care who you're for you're for me now you're for my government now you're going to join me in winning this war I mean, that's what we're going to do because we're going to make sure our future is taken care of. Congratulations, you won the lottery. Actually, you probably earned it because let's face it, spies tend to be very, very, very talented. And I think people need to understand, 
Terrorism is personal to me. Terrorism affects me. When people murder my people, when people do mass shootings against my people, do you know how often that happens and how often that's in my direction? It happens a lot. It's, it, there's not a, it's not a coincidence that I run into the Austin bomber. I'm just saying, like, this is a, a very common thing for me. Like, I, I know it sounds weird. Terrorism, like, towards your people is a common thing for you. Like, terrorism directly affecting you is a, ter is, is a common thing for you. Yes, at this point in my life, Terrorism is a common thing for me. Uh, it affects me, and that's why I take it so freaking seriously. And I think that terrorism is a symptom. I mean, it's a symptom of, uh, of a lot of other things that are happening in society. And um, if you want to live in a society where um, you have a strong like leader who's going to prevent terrorism attacks, not just with um, spying on people, but is also going to prevent ter terrorism attacks by fighting the philosophy Vote for me because I'm not going to try to encourage people like these crazy militia guys out in Arkansas who are going to poison an entire city. And Joe didn't do it. I don't even think they tried because they had no chance at doing it. They might have wanted to do it, but if you had to see the arms I had to twist to get that done, it was not a pretty picture. And everybody knows it, including some very liberal people that cried in my office. They cried in the Oval Office. Two weeks later, they're out saying, gee, we have to defeat him. Criminal justice reform, prison reform, opportunity zones with Tim Scott, a great senator from South Carolina. He came in with this incredible idea for opportunity zones. It's one of the most successful programs. People don't talk about it. Tremendous investment is being made. Biggest beneficiary, the black and Hispanic communities, and then historically black colleges and universities. After three years of coming to the office, I love some of those guys, they were great. They came into the office and they said, I said, what are you doing? After three years, I said, why do you keep coming back? Because we have no funding. I said, you don't have to come back every year. We have to come back. Because President Obama would never give them long-term funding, and I did. 10-year long-term funding, and I gave them more money than they asked for because they said, I think you need more. And I said, the only bad part about this is I may never see you again because I got very friendly with them, and they like me and I like them. But I saved it. Colleges and universities. Okay, and we're going to talk about both of your records, but your response to that, Vice President. My response to that is I never, ever said what he accused me of saying. The fact of the matter is, in 2000, though, after the crime bill had been in, 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 in the law for a while, this is a guy who said the problem with the crime bill, there's not enough people in jail. There's not enough people in jail. And go on my website, get the quote, the date, when he said it. Not enough people. Let's be honest. Donald Trump can act like he's against um, the prison system, but uh, everyone that is affected by the prison system knows that Donald Trump is for locking people up. And if black people think that Donald Trump is for them because Donald Trump talks like he's for them and some black people have endorsed him, you're nuts. Donald Trump is for the prison system. I know. I personally know the Department of Justice, Bill Barr, is who, like, you, when you want to know if, if Donald Trump's for the prison system, who, who did he point? Bill Barr. And Bill Barr is, like, the guy that was in charge when Joe Biden was pushing forward, forward these prison, these crazy laws about drugs and stuff like that. So, um, all I'm saying is, um, he's criticizing Joe for for hurting the black community with his with his crime bill, he put the Department of Justice head back then in charge of his Department of Justice now, and he has been very radical in putting people in jail. And he is not trustworthy. I'm talking about Bill Barr. Like, Bill Barr has gone way, way beyond the, beyond the Constitution. And I, I think that if you're a law enforcement person that goes um, outside the Constitution, then you should get in trouble for it. So... Uh, Donald Trump is definitely not for prison reform. He's for locking people up. He talked about marauding gangs, young gangs, and the people who are going to maraud our cities. This is a guy who, in the Central Park Five, five innocent black kids, he continued to push for making sure that they got the death penalty. None of them were, none of them were guilty of what the crime, of the crimes they were suggested. Look, and talk about he, granted, he did, in fact, let, 20 people, he commuted 20 people sentences. We commuted over 1,000 people sentences. 
over 1,000. The very law he's talking about is a law that, in fact, initiated by Barack Obama. And secondly, we're in a situation here where we, the federal prison system was reduced by 38,000 people under our administration. And one of these things we should be doing, there should be no, no minimum ma mandatories in the law. That's why I'm offering $20 billion to states to change their state laws to eliminate minimum mandatories and set up drug courts. No one should be going to jail because they have a drug problem. They should be going to rehabilitation, not to jail. The question is, what does your, what do, the, what does, what does the drug problem result in? Because did the drug problem result in them selling drugs and therefore um, they do have to go to prison for a long time? I mean, that's, that's the real question because generally drug addicts sell drugs and that's how they support their habit. And you can say that's not the case. It is the case. And so Joe Biden can say he's for drug courts because he is. And um, he is for drug addicts, but he's for drug addicts that don't actually sell drugs, that just buy drugs. And I think it's the same case with Kamal Harris. And my guess is that um, Barack Obama picked Kamal Harris because Barack Obama is that important in the, in the political party right now. And Barack Obama thinks Kamal Harris is the best, even though, like, in my opinion, historically black colleges aren't the best colleges. Um, they are colleges that were founded by people that had very ignorant belief systems. I, I, I know Howard has a lot of progressive thinking people. Believe me, I know there are very smart people at, at, at historically black colleges. There are programmers from historically black colleges that will run circles around me, I promise. But what I'm trying to tell you is there is a belief system that is ingrained in the culture that is built around a slave mindset, and I will never have a slave mindset. And um, I think that's important because my mindset is the reason that I can be the way I am, that I can think the way I am, that I can pursue the policies that I pursue. And I think that other people should want to join me in pursuing those policies because I want to save the planet. I want to do something incredible. I need people to join me in doing it. So let's do it together. We should fundamentally change the system and that's what I'm going to do. But why didn't he do it four years ago? Why didn't you do that four years ago, even less than that? Why didn't you I do it? You were vice president. You keep talking about all these things you're going to do, and you're going to do this. But you were there just a short time ago, and you guys did nothing. We did. You know, Joe, I, I ran because of you. I ran because of Barack Obama, because you did a poor job. If I thought you did a good job, I would have never run. Uh, I would have I, never run. <laughs> I ran because of you. I'm looking at you now. You're a politician. Before Barack Obama was elected, I wrote a lot of people in the government letters saying that we should use Barack Obama as a psychological warfare weapon. I, I'm pretty sure I wrote Robert Gates the letter too. And um, what I said is that he needs to go to Cairo in his first 100 days or the center of the Islamic world, which is Cairo. And he needs to give a speech and he needs to say in English um, words that get translated into Arabic in a certain way that um, work great for Muslim minds because it should be written in Arabic and then translated to English and then he should speak, it, it, he should speak in English but it should be written in Arabic first. And uh, I basically want him to go talk about his father and stuff like that. And there's a reason Barack Obama won a Nobel Peace Prize, it's because he was a pretty good peacemaker. I mean, it was the, the reason Barack Obama was so confusing for a lot of people is because like, this guy's like, the most peaceful worded guy of all time, but then he's like killing all these people. You know, I'm talking about in Pakistan with drone strikes. I mean, the Bush administration didn't do any drone strikes compared to the Obama administration. Obama got in charge and he started massacring people. And, um, and I, I think that what people need to understand is that um, all it takes is killing one person's family for uh, that person to come back at you someday and do 9-11 and that's why I believe that we should be a little bit more um, peaceful peaceful in our foreign policy until we're violent like I am not I'm like for the most peaceful like most beautiful foreign policy of all time until it's time to be violent and then I'm gonna be violent to the point that I don't have to worry about it because this this thing's settled and I think Barack Obama had no problem killing people so it's, I mean I don't know what, how I ended up got, getting to that point sorry about that I ran because of you. All right, Vice President Biden, your response to that, and then I do have some yeah. questions for both of you. Well, I tell you what, I, uh, 
I hope he does look at me because what's happening here is you know who I am, you know who he is, you know his character, you know my character, you know our reputations for honor and telling the truth. I am anxious to have this race. I am anxious to see this take place. I am the character of the country is on the ballot. Our character is on the ballot. Look at us closely. Let me ask some folks. Excuse me. Please. Res- I'm sorry, but I think that if there's anything we know is that your character has a little bit of a blemish on it. I mean, I don't know. I think my character has blemishes on it. Uh, honestly, I, I've, I don't want to talk about the stupid things I did when I wasn't thinking, like hitting golf balls at a, at a freaking house. Um, but, um, honestly, but your, your character thinks it's like right there in front of the entire world. You let your son be a political pawn in a way that just feels slimy. If this stuff is true about Russia, Ukraine, China, other countries, Iraq, if this is true, then he's a corrupt politician. So don't give me the stuff about how you're this innocent baby. Joe, they're calling you a corrupt politician. Nobody's calling President Trump, I want to stay on the issue of race. We're talking about the the issue. laptop from hell. President Trump, we're we're talking about race right now, and I do want to stay on the issue of race. President Trump, you've just... And I have to respond to that. Please. Because, look, there are 50 former national intelligence folks who said that what this he's accusing me of is a Russian plant. They have said that this is, has all the care. Four, five former heads of the CIA, both parties, say what he's saying is a bunch of garbage. Nobody believes it except the, his and his good friend, Rudy Gianni. You mean the laptop is now yeah. another Russia, Russia, Russia hoax? And that's exactly be. what is this that's where you're exactly going? What this is going. where he's going. The laptop that, right. is Russia, oh. Russia, Russia. I want to stay on the issue of race. You okay? have to be kidding. Here Mr. we go President, again with Russia. We're going to continue on the issue of race. Mr. President, you've described the Black Lives Matter movement as a symbol of hate. You've shared a video of a man chanting white power to millions of your supporters. You've said that black professional athletes exercising their First Amendment rights should be fired. What do you say to Americans who say that kind of language from a president is contributing to... I understand that people are concerned about the possibility that um, a white supremacist is elected right now or that a white supremacist will be elected to replace him. Because let's face it, I am a white supremacist. I'm not always a white supremacist. I, I, I heard about this kid who um, is a black kid who's a genius, who's in college right now, who's studying engineering, and he's very impressive. And I'm just saying, like, he's smarter than me, but he's not. And all I'm saying is that my people have invented everything. But um, what I wanted to say is, just because I think that the smartest of us, like the very, very, very smart, smartest of us, um, that we should be supreme, doesn't mean that I don't believe black is beautiful because I think all cultures are beautiful. You don't understand. I am the type of person that is chosen for diplomatic purposes. Like I, I'm a, I, I believe, I, do you want to know what I believe about myself? I am a diplomat, I'm a diplomat clone. I mean, Ben Franklin was the ultimate diplomat. He won the Revolutionary War. You can say George Washington did. No, Ben Franklin went and hung out with the French. And Ben Franklin was the perfect diplomat because Ben Franklin loved cultures. And I know who I am and who I am is someone that loves cultures. And I love all different types of people. And I especially love black people because I think that they're fun and they're funny. And sometimes black people drive me nuts if, if they embrace this whole nigga thing honestly like i mean i have i have friends that say the word nigga but the reality is that i don't think that black people should remind each other of like this dark history of of their slave history i think black people need to get past their slave history and get into us into a mindset like me and my mindset is you can never enslave me and and that's that's the kind of country i want to live in and i want to live in a country where you can never enslave us where we are free, and that's why we make progress, because we are free people here. Contributing to a climate of hate and racial strife. Well, you have to understand, the first time I ever heard of Black Lives Matter, they were chanting, pigs in a blanket, talking about police. Pigs, pigs, talking about our police. Pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. I said, that's a horrible thing. And they were marching down the street. And that was my first uh, glimpse of Black Lives Matter. I thought it was a terrible thing. As far as uh, my relationships with 
all people. I think I have great relationships with all people. I am the least racist person in this room. Well, what do you say to Americans who are concerned by that rhetoric? I, I don't know. The, I mean, I don't videos. know what to say. I got criminal justice reform done and prison reform and opportunity zones. I took care of black colleges and universities. I don't know what to say. They can say anything. I mean, they can say anything. It's a very — it makes me sad, because I am — I am the least racist person. I can't even see the audience, because it's so dark. But I don't care who's in the audience. I'm the least racist person in this room. Okay. Vice President Biden. This is a new room. And so let's be honest. Who's the least racist person in the room? The person that didn't grow up during segregation. The guy that grew up in the Los Angeles media. Everyone is the same. If you say the N word, that's the worst thing you've ever done in the history of the universe world. That's where I grew up. And so who's the least racist in the room? Me. Who is the least aware of race? I think it, at one point it was me. And now I have to be so aware of it because race exists and police treat people differently. And we need to be aware that um, black kids, when they go into a store, are going to get followed and white kids aren't, even though the white kid is the one that was shoplifting. At least I did when I was you know, 14 years old. And, and I actually got in trouble for it. And, um, all I'm saying is, um, I'm the least racist. And let me ask you very quickly, and then I have a follow-up question for you. Abraham Lincoln here is one of the most racist presidents we've had in modern history. He pours fuel on every single racist fire. Every single one. He started off his campaign coming down the escalator saying he's going to get rid of those Mexican rapists. He's banned Muslims because they're Muslims. He has moved around and made everything worse across the board. He says to the, about the poor boys, last time we were on stage here, he said, I told him to stand down and stand ready. Come on. This guy has a dog whistle about as big as a foghorn. President Trump, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to respond, and then I have a follow-up. You know, he made a reference to Abraham Lincoln. Where did that come in? I mean, you said you're Abraham that, Lincoln. No, no, where did that? No, no. You said I said not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody right. done what I've done for the black community. And I'm saying I didn't say I'm Abraham Lincoln. I said not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody done what I've done for the black community. Now you have done nothing other than the crime bill, which put. Oh, God. Th tens of thousands of black men, mostly, in jail. All right. Let me, you let know me what? Uh, let me they ask remember Vice it President because Biden if you look at what's happening with the voting right now, let me ask they Vice remember President that Biden you treated them very, very badly. The, Just the, take a look at what's happening out there. Vice President Biden, let me give you a chance to respond within this context. Crime okay. bills that you supported in the 80s and 90s contributed to the incarceration of tens of thousands of young black men who had small amounts of drugs in their possession. They are sons, they are brothers, they're fathers, they're uncles, whose families are still to this day, some of them suffering the consequences. So speak to those families. Why should they vote for you? One of the things is that in the 80s, we passed 100 percent, all 100 senators voted for it, a bill on drugs and how to deal with drugs. It was a mistake. I've been trying to change the sense, and particularly the portion on cocaine. That's why I've been arguing that, in fact, we should not send anyone to jail for a pure drug offense. They should be going into treatment across the board. That's what we should be spending money. That's why I set up drug courts, which were never funded by our Republican friends. They should not be going to jail for a drug or an alcohol problem. They should be going into treatment, treatment. That's what we've been trying to do. That's what I'm going to get done, because I think maybe the American people have now seen that, in fact, it was a mistake to pass those laws relating to the drug. But they were not in the crime bill. But okay. why so, didn't he get it done? See, it's all talk, no action with these politicians. Why didn't he get it done? That's uh, what I'm going to do when I become president. I want to be clear about something. Um, Joe Biden thinks that if someone uses drugs, they have a problem no matter what. They need treatment no matter what. There's something wrong with them no matter what. And what I'm telling you is Jimi Hendrix, there was nothing wrong with that guy. And maybe there was something wrong with Jim Morrison a little bit because um, he is the Lizard King or whatever. I don't even freaking know. But um, 
I, I don't think there's anything wrong with Paul McCartney, and it's pretty well known that the Beatles did some pretty serious experimentation with LSD, especially when they were hanging out in India. And so um, all I'm saying is we all should stop thinking that our morals are superior to everyone else's and stop forcing our morals on everyone. And we need to give people opportunities to seek treatment. I agree. There are serious, serious drug addictions that happen, especially when we're talking about crack cocaine. And when he's talking about this, this, this problem with the, when, when Joe Biden's talking about this problem with uh, cocaine in the, in the drug bill, he's talking about crack cocaine where, um, the black community, which is the poor, which is, which tends to be a poor community was disproportionately affected by the crack epidemic because, um, the sentencing was so harsh for people selling crack. And so it was like so many black people that were getting put in prison for long periods of time for selling crack. And that's because they were addicted to crack and the crack's so addictive that, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I remember this, this guy, Rick used to smoke crack in front of a mirror and they'd look at the mirror out the window to see if the police were coming for him. And he'd smoke crack by the candlelight when I was like 14 years old. Cause or at least that's what people told me. Cause he was, cause he was so paranoid because of crack. Cause well, crack's a serious, serious drug. And so that's why they sentence people that way. Um, but then there are a lot of conspiracies about crack. I met a guy who was from the 18th street street gang in Los Angeles. And I guess the FBI thought he was a shot caller for them. And, um, they interrogated him about some murders apparently while he was in prison. That's what he told me. And, um, he said that crack came from George Bush. So he blamed George Bush for it. Um, I don't know if the Illuminati invented crack. I know that science happens, but, um, I know that we should uh, try to discourage people from using crack and at least they should use cocaine if they're going to do that kind of drug. You were vice president, along with Obama as your president, your leader, for eight years. Why didn't you get it done? You had eight years to get it done. Now you're saying you're going to get it done because you're all talk and no action, Jim. We got your a lot response. of it done. We released 38,000. We got 38,000 prisoners left from the You got out, nothing done. 38,000 prisoners were released from federal prison. We have, there were over a thousand people who were given clemency. We make, in fact, we're the ones that put in the legislation saying we could look at pattern and practice of police departments and what they were doing, how they were conducting themselves. I could go on, but we began the process. We began the process. We lost an election. Let's be honest. This guy's from Washington, D.C. Who's from Washington, D.C.? The FBI. Who's from Washington, D.C.? All the federal law enforcement. So who's from Washington, D.C.? The DEA. So who's from Washington, D.C.? Um, a, 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 a large amount of federal agents who do not do drugs because they could never be a federal agent if they had done drugs in the last like 10 years. So um, he hangs out with these people all the time. They don't do drugs. They know that they're the best. There's a small chance that a lot of these politicians secretly um, do opiates and drink alcohol sometimes, but don't tell anyone. That's um, legal drugs. So as long as they're taking pills that have a prescription label on them, everything's fine. Uh, prescription drugs aren't drugs, according to these people. Um, so uh, all I'm saying is, we need to think about the culture of both sides of these people, uh, both sides of the aisle, because um, Donald Trump's culture isn't him. It's his party and it's the RNC. Donald Trump isn't in charge. I'm telling you, Donald Trump uh, has been choosing certain Catholic justices for a reason. Like he, he keeps choosing people from the same schools and stuff like that for a reason. He, he, he follows these patterns involving Catholic choices for a reason is because that's who uh, is really in control of the RNC, I think. And he chooses, and, and I'm talking about Joe Biden. Joe Biden chooses the path of the DNC. And so um, if you actually want real change, then you should choose me because I will help black people. And I, I will actually um, change our society so that the way that citizens interact with the police is, is not the way it is right now, because I think we should like the police. I tend to like the police if I actually know them. Um, but um, it's really hard to like them when they're harassing us.